lattice of uh, is related to electromagnetic fields. Uh, this is a lattice of, of, of gig resonators, okay, for microwaves. Uh, people this also did it, did it at 1.5 microns using photonic crystals with some magnetic element inside, okay, but the topological gaps, the gaps that you see here, this is a gap with uh, the edge states, these topological gaps in these materials are extremely, extremely small, and it could only be revealed when the system is lacing, and the system is lacing is, everything is narrow, all the emission lines are narrow. And here, uh, they break, they broke time reversal symmetry in an um, artificial fashion uh, by, by playing with the, 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 the sense of propagation of light in a, in, a, in a crystal, okay? So this is really a challenge to try to, to break time reversal symmetry in, in these systems and to observe magnetism in, in optics. So what I'm going to show you, is that um, we can use uh, um, the system in which I have been working in the past few years, which are uh, semiconductor micro cavities, to um, emulate the effect of magnetic fields in a, in a lattice. And also, I'm going to show you in the end how we can actually break the reversal symmetry, but not using magnetism, using interactions, okay? Using photon, effective photon photon interactions. So, this is what I'm going to present you. So, the, the system we are using are these micro cavities, uh, they are grown at, at the C2N. And they are made of a black mirror. So these are dielectric layers. The electric layers, here photons are trapped. Okay. And in the middle, we put a quantum well, an Indian Galileo Martian quantum well, uh, whose excitonic resonance, uh, and I don't need to explain to you what is an excitonic resonance, I think, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, very close to the, the frequency of the photons that are trapped in this, uh, in this uh, cavity. Okay. So then this, uh, this electron and hole pairs that are bound, which make the exciton in the quantum well, uh, can absorb a photon. They, uh, they, they exist then then emit a photon when they recombine, electron and hole recombine, they stay in the cavity, uh, the photons uh, are again absorbed by the, by the, by the quantum well, remitted, reabsorbed, remitted, and they are in this uh, uh, recycling uh, process for, for a long time, and then we can no longer talk of, of excitons and photons independently, but of what we call polaritons, okay? The nice thing about this is that they can, about these objects is that they combine the properties of photons and the properties of excitons. And <clears throat> In particularly from the excitonic component, so this is a matter component, so this is a real electrons, excited electrons in the system. You can get um, an active element for lacing, for instance, you can have uh, interactions, uh, polariton particle interactions or photo photon interactions dressed by this part. You can also have some sensitivity to magnetic fields, and this could be exploited actually to break down reversal symmetry, but it's not what I'm going to show you. So this is a planar cavity that comes out from the MBE machine, but and this cavity, we can etch it. We can etch it in these micro pillars. And now when you see it in this micro you see the size, two, four micrometers in diameter. You have confinement in the three dimensions of space, so in the vertical direction by the black mirrors, and in the horizontal direction by the index or refraction content. So this is like a, a, a quantum dot for, for light, okay, in which light is trapped in the three dimensions of space. And then you have your, your photonic modes are uh, gapped, okay, they are isolated photonic modes that you have here. This is the, we call it S mode because it's cylindrically symmetric. This we call it P mode because it has PX, PY orbitals. D mode, F mode, etc. Uh, and an analogy with the with the with the orbitals in a, in an atom. So this is for one, but we can put two together uh, if we etch the system in the correct way. So here are two micropillars uh, etched uh, overlapping, and then photons can jump from one side to the other. And then instead of having individual uh, photonic modes, we have a molecular modes for photons. So we have a bonding mode here, an anti-bonding mode here, a higher energy. And this energy separation between these two modes is actually given by the Hopping amplitude of photons from, from one pillar to the other, and with this we can control it by by playing with this distance here. So we have full control on the confinement and on the on the hopping of this uh, on these uh, photons that are dressed by by by, by the excitonic resonance. <laughs> so then now, now this is like our playground in which we can uh, build lattices that we describe very well in the tight binding limit. But um, and I'm going to show you an example in a second. So actually this is the example. So this is a honeycomb lattice. Uh, it's a two-dimensional lattice, uh, and <clears throat> it's made of micro pillars. Of, of, of these micro pillars, you see this is one micro pillar here. This is the top mirror, bottom mirror. The cavity is somewhere in the middle. We cannot see it very well, but it's somewhere in the middle. And you, you see that there are they form hexagons, so they form this hexagonal lattice. So uh, when you look at the um, at the coupling of these micro pillars in this hexagonal lattice, actually, you can look at the different uh, modes of the of the pillar. For instance, you can look at the S modes, and these S modes have a cylindrical sym symmetry. Exactly like the PZ uh, orbitals of graphene. Okay, so so then it, it, in the same way as electrons can hop from one side, one uh, carbon side to the other to the next in graphene. Here, photons can side can can jump from one micro pillar to the next, and the dispersion is very similar to the one of, gra of graphene, of course, because it's exactly the same kind of like geometry. So you have the two bands like in graphene. You have Dirac cones. Et we can also have the P modes here that you can see. They are up at higher energy. They also overlap. 
they also there's also there was also some hopping of, of photons in those modes and then you have uh, more elaborate bands so basically you have a flat band you have two bands with the uh, Dirac crossings you can see here and then you have an, up there another flat band or pseudo flat band so this is what we can use now to 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 play and to try to implement magnetism so how um, <laughs> so one way of doing it is a uh, um, uh, actually be inspired by what has been done in graphene and uh, and used strain okay so in graphene uh, uh, it has been shown in 2005 actually that you can actually strain a graphene sheet and induce an artificial magnetic field how does it work in the following way so this is the hamiltonian uh, the type in the hamiltonian uh, of, um, of of graphene okay of, of, or, or of our s bands um, this is the amplitude of the in, the in the basis of the a sides and the b sides so the blue and red uh, and red sides okay i know you're familiar with this uh, this is so this is the, the hamiltonian so it's sort of the jump the jumps from a blue side to a, to a red side that's why you have off diagonal elements here and if you uh, write this hamiltonian in momentum space and you expand it close to the dirac point close to the dirac point these terms here take, take this form okay so you see you have the, the dirac velocity here pro 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 proportional to the momentum the same in the y direction but you have an extra term that appears here okay when you do this expansion and this is, this term has the form of a gauge potential Okay. So this gauge potential uh, can be related to the hopping amplitudes uh, in the in the in the in the three hoppings that you that every side has in this way. Okay. So if the hoppings are the same, t1 equal t2 equal t2 t3, like in real graphene, normal graphene, then the gauge potential is zero. So there is no no magnetic field, no, no gauge potential. But if you um, make the the, the hoppings uh, asymmetric, then you can induce a, a gauge potential. Let me show you an example. Here we are we are having a, an example in which uh, uh, t1 uh, t2 is equal to t3 okay t2 is equal to t3 so this 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 gets this term is zero okay but we make t1 different from the other two so this term is not zero anymore and in addition we are we add a gradient in the in the hoppings okay in in one direction space so now we have a gauge potential with a gradient in space so you know from your electromagnetic courses that you have a gauge potential with a gradient you have a magnetic a magnetic field a constant magnetic field okay which is shown here okay so you see it's, it's shown here so it's a, it, it's a strength is related to the to the hopping to the gradient hopping sorry to the, to the, to the hopping of the to the gradient of the hopping that you can um, uh, create and uh, it also has a, a different a, a very specific particularity is that its sign depends on the value so if you are in the at the k point or at the k prime point the magnetic field will have opposite sign okay this is good we are safe because the system has not we have not breaking time reversal symmetry okay so we should not have any magnetic field just by, by, by putting some, some strain. We have opposite magnetic fields in opposite value. That's nice. But still, it allows us to, to observe interesting physics, like, for instance, the emergence of Landau levels. So how do we do that experimentally? So we take our honeycomb lattice. It's, it's, it's shown here. And you see uh, the, the hoppings in this uh, direction are different to the hoppings in this direction. The hoppings in the vertical direction are all the same, which means the distance are all the same. But here, they are more separated than they are here. They are much closer together. Okay, so we have a gradient of hopping in this direction, okay, which is exactly what we need to, to engineer this strain-induced magnetic field. So now you have here a magnetic field going up in the k point, at the k point, a magnetic field going down in the, at the k, k, k prime point. And if we look at the, at the eigenvalues, so now we have, so having the Dirac points that should be here, we have the Landau, Landau levels that appear uh, in, the same, in, in a very similar way as what you would expect from, from uh, real graphene under a magnetic field. So this is the lambda, the, L, the n equals zero Landau level, one, two, three, etc., and, and the same on the other on the other side of the cones. So let's see how it appears in our in our honeycomb lattice. So this is the honeycomb lattice um, without strain, the, the one in, with, from, from our micropillars. We have the S bands, we have the P bands. We are going to concentrate on the P bands, and the reason is that the hop, the, the hopping, the, the bands are much broader in the P bands because the hoppings are stronger. Okay, and it's much easier to see the the, the Landau levels. So this is a, an image of the uh, of light emitted at the energy of the Dirac cones here. As you can see the hexagonal, you can recognize the hexagonal shape. A bit more complicated because you have this px py orbitals, but you still have some hexagonal like uh, emission. And now let's put strain. So you put strain in momentum space. So this is momentum space. This is just the angle of emission of light in the, from, the from the sample. Now you have a much more complicated stuff here. But if you focus close to the, the zero energy, close to the Dirac point, you can see that now there are there is there is a line that appears here okay this line these two lines actually that appears here um, 
And this actually, this line actually corresponds to the to the, to, to the n equals zero lambda level. And we can recognize that because if we look at the emission in real space at that energy now, it's not anymore like that, it's hexagonal. Now it is uh, asymmetric. So light is more, is, there's more light coming from the B side and coming from the A side. You can see it here. There is, you can see here, there's another B side, another B side, okay? And this asymmetry between A and B sides is a characteristic of the wave functions of Landau levels, okay? Which you cannot, you, you don't observe. Moreover, you can see the n equals zero lambda level, but we can also see this other one, which is the n minus one lambda level. And in between the two, there is a, there is a, disp a, line, a dispersive line that you can see here that corresponds actually to edge states that appear because of the presence of the artificial magnetic field. <laughs> so these edge states are predicted if you do a tie binding simulation, and it has a, they have a particularity related to the fact that we are not really breaking time reversal symmetry. So actually, uh, so you can see here, the color means uh, the, the side, so this greenish color means that edge states, uh, the state, these states come from the right, right, right um, side. And you can see that there are only states coming from the right side, actually. And there are states at a given energy, there are states going uh, with a uh, group velocity and states with the opposite group velocity. So you have edge states that go down and go up uh, on the same side. And there are no edge states on the other side, okay? So this is very different to a, real, to a graphene in a real magnetic field. Graphene in a real magnetic field, you would expect uh, edge states on both sides, and you would, you would expect a chirality. So, so it's going like this and going like that, and chirality will be re reversed if you reverse the magnetic field, okay? But here we have this artificial magnetic field, which gives different uh, signatures, but still produces uh, edge states. And we can observe them in our experiment, okay? So we can just pump, uh, put light on the right edge, on the left edge, on the right edge, and you see that we put light on the, on the right edge, you see propagation, a bit of propagation over, the, over there and, and going down which is um, summarized here. So you see some decay of light at the right edge and a much faster decay at the left edge, okay? And in momentum space, if we look at the light that is emitted from this, this area here, we see that there, is, uh, there are these uh, lines that connect the n equals zero and the n equal minus one lambda level, while here there is a, a clear gap between the two because there are no edge states on this side. Very nice, so this is our first, um, <coughs> our first uh, um, implementation of these uh, lambda levels. And, and these lambda levels, uh, are, um, I mean, really inspired by what has been done in graphene, including the, 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 the strain graphene, can actually be, uh, be useful to do uh, some physics that is really in the, optical, in the optics domain, for instance, lacing, okay? You could imagine having lacing, a laser, on a lambda level. And, um, and we have not yet uh, observed that, but we have now new samples that we received uh, last week in which we will be able to do that. Uh, what has been predicted um, um, theoretically is that uh, if you pump the, 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 the system with, um, with electrically or with some uh, non-resonant laser, you can actually observe lacing in the lambda levels. And in the lambda levels, there will be vorticity that appears spontaneously okay? in, the lacing, in the lacing mode. And the, um, there will be a net, there can be a net circulation. And this net circulation comes from a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay? Sometimes the, you will switch on the laser and it will, it will uh, rotate in one direction. And the next time will be rotating in the opposite direction in a random way. Okay, so this is a very interesting perspective to try to observe lacing in these lambda levels and this, uh, the emergence of this uh, vorticity. This is a laser that we have already observed in the, in the non-strain uh, graphene. So that's just to tell you that uh, it's actually quite promising that we will be able to address this physics in the, in the next few months. Okay, so I show you what we can do with, uh, with strain to, to engineer these uh, photonic lambda levels. Now I'm going to show you how we can break time reversal symmetry um, <coughs> using uh, exciton exciton polariton barton interactions or interaction between, between photons. So, um, so let's go. So, so far, I have not uh, discussed much about uh, polarization. Actually, I discussed, I discussed nothing about polarization effects. Uh, you, we are using light, so we have two polarizations, of course. Uh, in the circular polarization basis, would be right circular polarization and left circular polarization. Okay, so this is something that we should, we can take into account in, in, our, in our system. And if we can want to describe the emission from just a single micropillar in, in detail, um, we need to use two equations, one for, the, for each of the two polarizations. So this is the, the kind of a Schrodinger-like equation that actually describes the emission from one of these micropillars, okay, for stigma plus polarization. So you see here we have the, the evolution of the amplitude of the field uh, in, the S, in the S mode, for instance, okay, the amplitude of the field is equal to the, here we have the energy of the S mode, okay, plus, uh, for, uh, polariton polariton interactions, okay, in this term, plus this term uh, represents interactions between 
the polaritons that are here and the reservoir uh, of excitons that are not uh, not forming the polaritons but that exist at high momenta. Okay, we have some a reservoir of excitons, and then we have these two terms here that corresponds to the losses. So photons are escaping out of the these pillars in, uh, continuously, and also the relaxation from this reservoir of excitons that we are actually pumping with our laser to the to this mode. Okay, these two terms correspond to that. So we have this equation for sigma plus polaritons, and we have the same equation for sigma minus polaritons, and then we have another equation to describe the dynamics of this reservoir. So here is the, the density of the, of the reservoir of spin up excitons and spin down excitons. We have some losses, relaxation towards the polariton level here. So this R is, R is the same, okay? Plus the external pump in which we are feeding, we, we are feeding this. So these actually three equations represent, or actually four equations because they are plus minus here. They represent very well the, the dynamics of the, of the system. Um, nice. Um, so now you see that I included interactions that I was not considering before. Okay, and I, uh, one, one, one uh, specific comment I want to do is that actually the interactions that dominate when we excite the system like this, so we put our laser out of resonance, create a reservoir of excitons, they relax down and light is emitted. Interactions that dominate are these ones here, the reservoir. So uh, this term is the one that dominates the interaction. This is the first comment. So this term, I will neglect, I will neglect it. Polariton particle interactions here are very, very small. Second important comment, and this is the most important one actually, is that you can see that these two equations are decoupled. They are completely independent. So this means that uh, polariton and polariton interactions are strongly spin dependent. Uh, uh, only uh, polaritons with uh, spin up, um, or spin, up uh, spin, or I mean, or, or circular polarization, will not interact with polaritons with spin down or opposite circular polarization. And the reason of that, for that, is uh, that is the line matter nature of this system. Okay, I will not go into the details, but the, this, uh, these polariton polariton interactions are governed by exciton exchange interactions. And because uh, <coughs> some exciton levels are dark, those which have a, a spin two are dark, and only excitons with spin one are bright, are coupled to light. Because of that, you can, you can very easily see if uh, in, in, in five minutes, if I, if I will have an extra five extra minutes, you can easily see that these two, uh, th these interactions are strongly spin dependent. And this is what we're going to use to break down reverse asymmetry. Okay, so how do we do that? So what we do is that we actually pump our laser with uh, a polarized laser, for, with, with our system with a polarized laser, for instance, sigma minus. We create a reservoir of excitons that is mostly in, uh, in minus, okay? Of course, there's some spin, spin uh, flip, and there will be a bit of uh, reservoir in, of the other polarization. And this reservoir of, of majority n minus polaritons will actually induce a blue shift through this term here. Induce, uh, will change the energy, the eigen energy of the system through this term uh, towards higher energies. And you can see here that when we increase the power, so a low power, this is the, the spectrum of emission. Uh, both sigma plus and sigma minus uh, polarized uh, polaritons emit at the same energy, this, this mode here. And when we start to increase the power, actually you see that one peak goes more to the right, more to higher energies, is more blue shifted because we are populating more these, these terms here, sorry, these n minus terms here, with respect to that one, and this is creating a, a splitting here. So you see it's a splitting between two polarizations, which are set to two different spins, so it looks like a Siemens splitting, okay? It's a Siemens splitting, but it's not induced by a magnetic field, it's induced by our laser. And you can see here the, the summary of this, of this experiment in which we can see the, the, the splitting between the two, the two lines. Of course, if I put linearly polarized light, there will be no splitting. I will see a blue shift because both reservoirs will increase uh, and they will both uh, bring up our, 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 um, our polaritons, but there will be no splitting because both reservoirs will be equal, okay? So no splitting. Of course, if I reverse the polarization of my, my external laser, then the splitting, Siemens splitting will be on the other way. Very nice, so can we do something uh, interesting with this? And the answer is actually yes. We can do something, not, I don't know if interesting, but at least uh, more fun. Uh, and, it, and we can see that if we look at the P modes here. So I was concentrated on the S modes here. Now I'm going to look at the P modes here. So these are these PX, PY modes that are represented up here, okay? Uh, so they, they have a, a zero of in intensity at the center and, and a phase difference of pi between the two lobes. So there are two. I can rearrange the, my bases and I can make them make my bases look like this, L plus one, L minus one. So this is this one plus I, this one makes me this. This one minus i, this one makes me this, okay? And these are vertical, vertical modes. So they have some circulation of the phase, zero to two pi around, zero to two pi around, okay? So I'm going to label them like that with the orbital angular momentum. 
Now I need to add the, the polarization, the pseudo spin. So and now I have four modes. So the, the orbital angular momentum plus the, the, the polarization. So they should all be degenerate. I should have four modes that are degenerate, but actually they are not. And they are not because um, I, as I have a, a finite size system, the, the, magnetic, the electromagnetic field on the edges of the system penetrates out, okay? And it penetrates out of the, of the micropillar in a different way depending on the polarization. So when you take that into account, your eigenmodes are look like this. I have now, instead of having one uh, for the generate level, I have three levels. This one is, uh, is made of this minus one vortex sigma plus, plus one vortex sigma minus. The upper one is the same thing, but with a minus sign here. And then in the middle, I have these two, the generate modes, uh, in which, which are coupled couple, couple angular momentum and polarization, okay, in, individually. So this is what you see here. You can see three levels here. These three levels correspond to these three, three levels that are here, okay? This one is double degenerate. Nice, let's now pump the system uh, with uh, uh, my reservoir, polar reservoir. So I'm going to blue shift that one, I'm going to blue shift that one, but in particular, I'm going to split these two guys, okay? I'm going to split these two guys in energy. And what is nice is that these guys not, are not only split in polarization, they're also split in angular momentum. So I am inducing a uh, splitting in circulation of, of, the angular, of the orbital angular momentum of light uh, by uh, pumping the system in the, in, in, with this polar light reservoir. <laughs> so this is what we see. These are the three, the, the spectrum at uh, low, low intensity. Uh, you see the three, the three levels, okay? This is emission energy, the three levels. And then when I increase the power of my sigma minus uh, reservoir, um, you see that the, the, the central line starts to split in two, okay? You can see it here very clearly, split in two. And uh, my two modes here are separated in energy. So now if I filter with a spectrometer one of them, I will see a vortex. This is exactly what I see. I filter in energy this one, and I see a vortex of, in, of phase in, in the light that is emitted. And if I filter the other one, I will see a vortex of, of phase in the, upper, in the opposite direction. So they have vortices, uh, orbital angular momenta, uh, different energies. And this is a, a consequence of the breaking of this time reversal symmetry. I'm inducing chirality, um, inducing chirality in the system. Okay, so this is the, um, what I wanted to, to tell you. Okay, so I showed you we can uh, engineer land levels for photons with automagnetic field using this strain engineering. And there are, there are interesting perspectives to, to explore um, lacing effects in, uh, in, uh, in this uh, Landau level uh, landscape, okay? Um, with flat bands, also this is another aspect I didn't mention, but uh, having flat bands is also very interesting for many applications, including also interactions. Um, and then I showed you that we can, uh, we can have this interaction induced magnetic fields for polaritons. So the interest of this is that we can do a staggered magnetic potentials, for instance, so we can imagine lattices in which the, pot the magnetic field locally is different in different places. Uh, which is very difficult to do with an external magnetic field. And also, uh, this is one of our big projects, which is trying to do, to, to do a, an actually a churn insulator. So uh, really um, <coughs> the equivalent of the Haldane, the Haldane model or the, or the quantum hole effect more generally, but without a magnetic field, just induced by interaction, okay? So by, by playing with these reservoirs, uh, we can actually try to, to, to implement that. There are papers that theoretically prove that this is possible and we just need to, find the good conditions to do the experiment. Okay, so with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alberto, for the speech. Um, do we have any questions? Yes, Matthias, please ask questions. Online, so uh, so there's something I missed, uh, probably I was not paying enough attention, but um, I'm a bit confused about uh, defining a momentum space and Brillouin zones and strain the lattices, or did I not, I mean, there's no more periodicity when the lattice is strained. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Yes, you're right on that. So actually, the the the, the first proposal uh, of this uh, phenomenon in um, in real graphene, uh, what uh, Game and uh, and other people propose is to strain the, the graphene in in three directions. Okay, so you do some trigonal strain. There you don't have any periodicity at all. Still, locally, 
you can imagine, you can uh, locally, if the strain is very smooth, you can say you are almost periodic, okay? And you just, uh, uh, you just um, put the effect of the strain on the, <clears throat> on the Hamiltonian here, like I'm, I'm, I'm showing here, okay? But, <clears throat> but this is not what we do anyway. What we do is a uh, strain in one direction only, okay? So in this direction, there's no periodicity anymore, but you still have to predict it in this direction. <laughs> and all these figures I'm showing here, this, K, this KY is well defined because it's this KY here, okay, in which, where, where you have some periodicity. Yes. Yeah, it was too fast. Okay. <laughs> so, or maybe. Il n'y a plus de son dans le micro. Ah, okay. working. Sorry about that. Yeah, so we are considering two situations. One uh, in which we are looking at the lambda levels and suddenly lacing in the lambda levels, and the, the tendency to form vortices uh, when you put many photons in this in these lambda levels uh, as a consequence of the spontaneous symmetry breaking related to the lacing effect. And the second situation is uh, is um, in the regular graphene, so no strain, no lambda levels, which you have direct cones, and when you add a Seaman effect, as either by um, applying an external magnetic field or uh, this reservoir engineering, uh, you see that uh, at the Dirac cones, uh, a gap opens, and this gap is a topological gap. And if you have an edge, you have edge states. So, and in practice, how do you do the um, uh, chiral pumping? Is it simply a quarter wave plate, or it's just that? It's so simple as that. Okay. Right. That was a stupid question. 